So moving on, we introduce the next speaker. It's a pleasure. Uh, Dr. Marion Peters. Dr. Peters uh, is the uh, head of the hepatology research and uh, also the chief of the liver clinic. And uh, I just want to mention that it's very important to the community physicians about you know, how the liver clinic is run. And Marion really transformed the organization you know, culture at UCSF now is a role model for the whole medical center in how the liver clinic performs. So, you know, so it's a lot of credit to Dr. Peters. Wearing a different hat, Dr. Peters is also a world-class expert in autoimmune and cholestatic liver disease, and I can't think of anybody better to talk about, is it IgG4 or not IgG4, autoimmune cholangiopathy. Thank you very much, Francis, and I know that Sandy and I are between you and dinner, so we're going to move. Uh, many of you in the audience will know this little flower. She first was diagnosed at age 14 in SoCal with right upper quadrant discomfort, fatigue, mixed cholestatic, let's see if I can do this, mixed cholestatic hepatocellular disease, normal bilirubin, INR, albumin, but a big globulin gap, normal ceruloplasmin, elevated IgG, positive ANA and SMA, viral hepatitis negative, MRCP normal, and a liver biopsy that showed plasma cells, piecemeal necrosis with lymphocytes and plasma cells out of the portal tract falling into the lobule and some bile duct injury. So what is this disease? By the simplified score of Henny's for autoimmune hepatitis, she'd get two points for elevated IgG over 10%, two points for autoantibodies, two points for no viral hepatitis, and one out of two points for her biopsy because it's not classic, but it's consistent. So that gives a seven out of eight definite autoimmune hepatitis, except autoimmune hepatitis shouldn't have abnormal bile ducts. So what about autoimmune cholangiopathy, which is not large bile ducts, but little bile ducts with a high IgG, positive ANA, a normal MRCP, but pathology showing portal tract bile duct damage. Well, she was diagnosed with autoimmune hepatitis, treated with budesonide, cell sept, and normalized her ALT, and then moved to the better half of the state. Um, so these are the autoantibodies. You can see they both have ANA, SMA, and IgG. So what's really important is to ask your pathologist about the bile ducts. If there's no comment, go back and say, can you look at the bile ducts? Do they look normal? And steroids, as you know, is the mainstay of treatment with either azathioprine or Celsep, depending if you're a pediatrician or a hepatologist. At age 19, while she was at the University of Berkeley, she had episodes of epigastric pain that were really severe after meals, requiring going to the ER, getting Norco. Her ultrasounds showed sludge. Her MRCP, again, was normal. I said to Chris Fries, if she was 30 years older, we'd have taken a gallbladder out yesterday. She's 19, she doesn't have any, so eventually after about Nine months of the poor young thing being tortured, Dr. Fries took her to the OR very quickly after he saw her. It was me who was slow. And her gallbladder was no gallstones, but full of plasma cells. And there were IgG4 plasma cells. Her IgG4 was 169. Her IgG was elevated. She, her pain went away, has never come back. Her ALT returned to normal and her ALKFOS to near normal. So this is IgG4, whoops a days, I don't think I can do it. Okay, on the left 
In the middle is, no, I can't do it. I can't show you the picture. On the left, in the middle where the hole is, is a bile duct. You can see, if you come up really close, plasma cells, lymphocytes going in. You can also see the blue falling out into the pink of the liver. And on the right, that's a stain for IgG4. This is um, autoimmune hepatitis. So the top left is interface hepatitis with the lymphocytes and plasma cells coming into the parenchyma. The bottom is the eccentric, very dark plasma cells. And, uh, and you can even get multinucleated giant cells. At age 20, so this is six years into her disease, she lost her response to budesonide and azathioprine. And her alkaline phosphatase became more elevated. And at that point, her MRCP looked like PSC. And at 22, it looked like classic PSC. This is well described, children having autoimmune-like hepatitis transitioning to PSC as they grow older. So what do we know about IgG4-related disease? It's an immune-mediated disorder of many organs with organ enlargement usually, with increase in T helper cells, increased T regs, and a lot of B cell activation. It has a male predominance. It's reported in all ethnic populations, but it's really, the literature is owned by the Japanese. Not that only the Japanese get it, but 75% of the cases are reported by the Japanese. Diagnosis is made in pathologic specimen, and classically it responds to steroids. These are all the organs, just any organ. And any name. If you go back in the literature, there are all these different names, some of which I've placed up here. Um, Kutner tumor for sialidinitis, um, Rydell's thyroiditis, sclerosing mesenteritis, pseudotumors of the orbit or the stomach, that now they're being recognized that in fact it's IgG4-related disease, and these are the extrahepatic manifestations seen with IgG4 autoimmune pancreatitis, which was actually the first described. So what are the GI manifestations of IgG4-related disease? Number one, sclerosing pancreatitis. Number two, autoimmune hepatitis, which shouldn't be number two, it should be number three because it's much rarer. And then uh, primary sclerosing cholangitis. And the question is, do you call that IgG4-related sclerosing cholangitis, or do you put it under the umbrella of primary sclerosing cholangitis and it's a subset? I'm not going to go into that argument. But if you look at all patients with PSC, about 20% have IgG4-related disease, 8% have pancreatitis. But a fact that's probably not well known is at least half the patient have gallbladder wall thickening. So I think we often overlook the gallbladder if there are no stones. They may have IgG4-related gallbladder disease. And I think that's an important take-home point. What about IgG4 autoimmune hepatitis? It's described in the literature. I have only one case of a man who came in with pancreatitis, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, went to the OR, it was IgG4 pancreatitis, had his gallbladder out, that was full of IgG4, and he has classic autoimmune hepatitis. He does not have any biliary disease. His biopsy looks exactly like autoimmune hepatitis with normal bile ducts, but it's not very common. So you have to have an elevated IgG4, a characteristic liver biopsy, coexistent of IgG4-related disease, a normal MRCP, normal bile ducts on biopsy, and response to steroids. So distinguishing autoimmune hepatitis from sclerosing cholangitis, they both have elevated IgG4, they both have IgG4-related disease, but the autoimmune hepatitis have the characteristic autoimmune biopsy and a normal MRCP, 
whereas the sclerosing cholangitis have an abnormal MRCP or ERCP. And in many cases, they are steroid responsive if they're very inflammatory. But if they're sclerotic, steroids, all the literature would suggest that steroids don't benefit. So what about autoimmune cholangiopathy, which is what I was asked to talk about, which is, if you th is the small bile ducts in the portal tracts associated with uh, portal tract inflammation and predominantly uh, plasma cells. This was well described about 25 years ago with a normal MRCP, elevated serum IgG, characteristic liver biopsy with bile duct damage and effectiveness of steroid therapy if it was predominantly hepatocellular. What's not reported in the literature is how many of these patients actually have IgG4. And few of them have IgG4-related disease. So if we think of autoantibodies in PBC, PSC, and autoimmune cholangiopathy, it's the, a it's the AMA in PBC, IgM in PBC, perhaps ANCA in PSC, and IgG4 in a subset, and I don't think we know the answer in autoimmune cholangiopathy. So if you're looking at autoimmune liver diseases, you need to rule out viral hepatitis. A liver biopsy will distinguish autoimmune hepatitis from autoimmune cholangitis. You need to test the autoantibodies depending on the age and whether it's hepatocellular or cholestatic. Do an IgM, AMA if it's cholestatic. Do an MRCP if the patient's alkaline phosphatase is elevated, and the pediatric guidelines require an MRCP in all children with autoimmune hepatitis because of the frequent transition, and follow the ALKFOS and the MRCP in the young, and always do an IgG4. We often forget that, and just to remind you that IgG4 can present as a tumor which it isn't in the pancreas, in the bile ducts, in the liver, which can be even more challenging and make us send our patients to Dr. Arane to do all his fancy schmancy stuff that I was incredibly jealous of. And he can't do my liver biopsies. <laughs> so when we think about trying to distinguish autoimmune hepatitis and autoimmune cholangiopathy, I think the points are, number one, always make sure that the pathologist looked at the bile ducts. Steroids are the mainstay of therapy, but do an MRCP if the pathology shows bile duct damage, and of course in young children with an autoimmune diagnosis. So in the spectrum of disease, you can have disease from the hepatocyte to the small to the large bile ducts, and there's overlap with all syndromes. I think the Next take home point is treat the predominant disease. Is it predominantly hepatocellular? Is it predominantly cholestatic? So here's my little picture of overlap syndromes, which I did at five o'clock in the morning over breakfast. And on the left, you can see autoimmune hepatitis, steroid responsive, ANA, LKM, IgG, very rare IgG4 reported in the literature. Yes, I have a case, but it isn't that common. On the right is PBC, which is AMA positive, high IgM, cholestatic, urso responsive. Remember, children can go from autoimmune hepatitis to PSC, so you always have to have that in the back of your mind. Tell the parents the first time you see them, because then they're prepared when it happens. So it's really in the middle is autoimmune cholangiopathy, which isn't large bile duct, is a normal ERCP, is that an IgG4-related disease? And my careful review of the literature, I have to come down and say, I don't know. I don't think that any of the patients we have that we call autoimmune cholangiopathy are in fact IgG4, but whether there are a small subset, I don't have an answer, because there's no reports yet. So the spectrum of disease 
goes from the hepatocyte to the small to the large bile duct. Treat the predominant, if it's cholestatic, with budesonide and azathioprine in non-serotic autoimmunes and autoimmune cholangiopathy. Prednisone if serotic. Urso is first line in PBC. Low dose urso is a different argument, but it's of limited benefit in PSC. IgG4 related diseases do respond to prednisone, but in the PSC patients, if they're very sclerotic, they may not respond. But we've all seen patients with very inflammatory masses in the bile ducts that have melted away with prednisone. And there are reports in the literature of rituximab doing the same thing, anti-CD20, which will obliterate B cells. And remember, it's a very highly B cell related disease. I think it's something to keep in the back of your mind if the patient isn't responding to steroids. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Mary. That was a, that was a great talk. Uh, so maybe I can ask the first question, Mary. Um, so do you believe in a non-serotic patient with autoimmune liver disease, you can you can wean them off therapy completely? Which which how do you decide? So um, so. So patients who, ha sorry, patients who have autoimmune hepatitis can be weaned off steroids. Do it slowly. Usually they're on budesonide and uh, azathioprine or Celsept. Remember, there's never been a randomized controlled study of Celsept, only of azathioprine, but the pediatricians use Celsept. What you do is the data clearly show you monitor the IgG, and if the IgG goes under 1,200, remember, normal IgG is 1,600, but all patients whose IgG was over 1,200 failed to be able to get off uh, immunosuppression. And 50% of the patients whose IgG went under 1,200 were able to get off. So I say to my patients, we'll take our time, we'll slowly go off budesonide, then we'll decrease the azathioprine, and then if your IgG is under 1,200, we'll give it a try to stop. Yes? So that's a good question. Is there any role for biopsy? The old Chaya data, he said, you know, wait two or three years and repeat the biopsy. But if someone's ALT has been 18 for 18 months, the biopsy is going to look really nice. So I don't do a biopsy, I just monitor the IgG. And his guidelines haven't used that. But it's clear from this paper in the Journal of Hepatology that the IgG is very helpful, cheap, and not painful. <laughs> 